So uh, welcome to today's panel discussion for the ICSI Student Mentorship Workshop. My name is Shane McIntosh. I'm one of the co-chairs. And today with me, I have three recent super rising stars of the software engineering community. So um, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Hey everyone. Yeah. So welcome to ICSI, the workshop. So hopefully we can give you some, you know, some advice. So my name is Yu. I'm a writing last year PhD student from the University of Michigan. So uh, my research direction is on the intersection of software engineering and the human factors. Great. So I go, go next. Uh, so my name is Mohammed and uh, I'm postdoc uh, in, at Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, I got my PhD from Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. And yeah, I hope you learn something from this panel today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Cui Yun Gao. You can just call me CY, uh, that's much easier. And uh, currently, I'm an assist assistant professor in Harbin Institute of Technology. Um, I got my PhD from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I hope you can learn something from uh, the workshop uh, here. Okay. Great, thanks for that. Um, so the way that this panel discussion will go is that I've got a list of questions for them. I'm going to throw them out one by one and we're gonna have a free form discussion and we'll see where it goes. So the first question that I have is, for each of you, how did you go about picking a university and picking an advisor? Yeah, so maybe I would go first this time. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so for my process, actually I was working as an, uh, a developer in a company and I want to pursue my uh, graduate studies. So I was mainly looking in North of America. So that's my first, was my first criteria. And then I was more interested on software engineering, um, maintenance of software systems, et cetera. So I, I looked at for different professors. I looked at their web pages. Uh, I mean, each, each lab has its own its own web page where the people put their publications, etc. So I read some. I mean, briefly what each professor is uh, is working on, and then I write a personalized email. Um, that I sent to all the professors. Um, yeah, so then professors, we contact, we contact people, we contact students, uh, generally people give assignments or professors give uh, assignments. So they test your ability for coding, uh, for how to analyze data, etc. And that was most of it. Okay, yeah, I basically agree with what Mohammed just said. Yeah, that's like a very similar process for me too. But the other thing I may also check at the same time is in the department of one university, you may want to check in the directions you're interested in how big the group is. Or, you know, you also want to check in their group, you know, how many students are there. Can you find some students to talk to you? Maybe before you make a decision, you want to talk to some students to get some, you know, firsthand information about the group. Yeah. Uh, okay. I strongly agree with you because uh, during my PhD application, I also uh, did the same thing. I emailed the professor and also checked the website to see uh, how many students have been graduated and how long the graduation. <laughs> so some, some of them may take uh, more than uh, six years or seven years. Maybe there are some reasons, but most of them graduate uh, in around five years. So. That's it. That's not makes sense for me. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's very important for PhD students. Uh, not a very harsh process, you know. You, you know. Um, also, I discussed with my supervisor about the direction to see whether the direction is uh, interesting to me and whether uh, I have some basic knowledge. Uh, for me, uh, 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 totally new or not very. Um, an interesting topic would be very uh, hard and it could take me for a long time to go through uh, to the, the basic knowledge and uh, and the think about new ideas and uh, produce some publication. I think it's very difficult. So for me, 
uh, I count more on the research topic and also the group. And uh, you know, uh, have, have a large team is good because you can discuss with them uh, when you face some difficulty, difficulties, yes. Right, yeah, and I think all of you are pointing out an interesting uh, switch of perspectives that a lot of students don't think of. And that's that while you're interviewing for a position at a school, you're also interviewing your potential advisor in your potential location. So you shouldn't look at it as, will they accept me? But, you know, should I accept them is another aspect of this, this search as well. Now, you, you all touched a little bit on, you know, checking out the group and seeing if the group is too big, too small, is it the right fit for you? So was that one perspective of building a support network that you all went through? Was that the only aspect or, or how did you go about cultivating a support network for, your, for yourselves? Yeah, I think for a PhD, the support network can come from, you know, different perspectives. You know, you want support from, from your advisor. That's when you can think about, do you yourself, do you pray for a smaller group so the advisor may have more time for you? Or you pray for a larger group when you have more support from other students. Or you pray for like a larger department, you have more support from other faculties. So I think you need to make your decision based on your own working style and preference. You know, some students, you know, they may prefer a more hands-on experience, which means they want more time from their advisors. But some students, they may prefer hands-off advising style, like you want more time with yourself to think, to work on your own thing. So you, you, you definitely should think about that, then figure out what you want. So. And there are many students who often look at for co-supervisors. So they apply for one professor and then when they are there, they look for another co-supervisor so they can get feedback from more people. And that's an option that maybe you should, I mean, a student should think about when uh, applying. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the admissions process. So some of the viewers are going to be undergraduate students, senior ones who are thinking about grad school. So do you have any tips for getting through the admissions process? So you guys all mentioned reaching out to professors. How do you catch their eye? Yeah, uh, this time I was that first. <laughs> I think uh, first we need to uh, uh, get a certificate for Chinese students. They need to uh, get uh, get a uh, certificate for proving their English uh, ability. So they need to have a TOEFL or other uh, testing, uh, other test examinations for them. So the second time, the second important thing is to prepare. A uh, complete CV, <laughs> yeah. Because in CV you need to list all the abilities you have and all the awards or experiences to catch your the supervisor's eyes. Or you have some publication. Uh, that's why it would be very important. Uh, so uh, preparing a good CV is important step. Um, other things is uh, maybe mm, check on the website to see. Uh, whether uh, the the automation process, so you sh you you need to catch the deadline because uh, some uh, universities provide uh, some uh, summer competition for the students to uh, to enter, and uh, they will pick some very uh, excellent students from the this uh, summer uh, competition. But for others, uh, they need to apply during the other periods, like autumn or spring. And uh, so uh, students should prepare well, well before the deadline so they can have more chances to go into the group they are more interested. Yes, in my suggestion. Yeah, I think um, students, you know, they may come from different countries. They may be interested in having a graduate degree from different countries. But you need to be aware that from different countries, the process of the admission can be very different. So it takes time. So my suggestion is, you know, you should always prepare yourself earlier. Like from the deadlines, usually in North America is, uh, I think, 
starting from October to like a January, something like that. That means you should probably start, you know, looking for those information at least one year ago. By the information, it includes what English test, for example, they required or what kind of professional test they require like a GRE or yeah GRE for engineering school and also you know what kind of uh, statements you need to prepare in advance and what how many recommendation letters they require so I highly suggest the students you know to be a little bit organized in this process because you can easily lose track of what you're doing so just for example, have a spreadsheet list all the schools you want to you know apply for their deadlines their requirement and also a folder for each school of those, you know, uh, documents, everything you need, then start earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like you just start earlier. I remember I started, I can't, I think more than one year before. So yeah. the process <laughs> is too long and students should be very patient uh, because like you go through a long process before even the deadline. And yeah, I also suggest to prepare the package very well. So it's not like you should not spam people, right? So it's not like one CV and one email for everybody. We should personalize based on what the professor is doing, uh, what are your research interests, uh, etc. And one thing, maybe make your package reviewed by somebody, maybe somebody from your family or professor in your undergrad uh, program or anybody who can review your 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 CV and your email and review. Because the first thing that's catch professors is the email, right? So when you read the email, it gets an idea about this person uh, before going to his CV, right? Yeah, and also professors, so they sometimes they cannot reply your email immediately. So you need to give them time, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. And I think you, you touched on a, a good point to avoid as well, right? So um, kind of a form letter where the professor's name is clearly just uh, percent S. Yeah, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, okay. So any other tips or things to avoid about getting into grad school? Otherwise, we'll shift to the next topic. Okay. So why don't we shift into the getting started phase? So you've been admitted to grad school. Um, did you encounter any problems getting started, uh, like getting your research or your, your degree started? Well, for me, I didn't have any technical problem to say. Uh, but my problem was m more with English. So my English was the third language at that time. Well, it's still, it's still the third language. <laughs> uh, so it was difficult to start research in the beginning. But yeah, it was it wasn't a technical problem. Okay. Yeah, I think it's um, more of a mindset switch problem for me back then because when I was in and when you were an uh, undergrad, your, your main job for most of you is just taking classes and do good, you know, course pro projects, get a high GPA, and maybe do some research when you have free time, but not a lot of pressure on that. However, when you start grad school, you will realize that probably taking classes is not the most important thing for you anymore because you need to, you know, switch yourself to be adapted to this fast pace of research work while you're taking classes. So time management is important at, um, at that time, especially at the very beginning. Usually in the first few weeks, you also need to, you know, manage some time on orientation stuff, you know, a lot of like a paperwork or stuff like that, especially for international students. So you need to keep all of those things in mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, the most difficult thing during the orientation uh, is to have a definite research topic because at that time, um, during the start, you, you do not know uh, which topic uh, is suitable for you. There are many uh, seniors in the group and they will give you some advice on the research directions and they will gi uh, give you some recommendations on papers. But, um, not all of the papers or the direct directions are suitable for the uh, students. So uh, we need to take a lot of time to read these papers and dig deep into uh, the, the 
dirty things to see whether this topic is suitable for the uh, up forward years. You know, the PhD period is around uh, four years or five years or like you even longer, so this topic is very important. So at the beginning, I have several discussions with my supervisor several times. So my supervisor uh, will uh, give me some suggestions on the direction based on his experience and the other uh, experience uh, in the in, you know the seniors in the in the, in the group. Uh, so the one thing is a research topic. The second is that I need to. Um, you know, it's a new environment. So for me, I need to uh, uh, accustom myself to the whole new environment. So there are a lot of things to learn during the start. So uh, including the relationships around around ourselves and other uh, the languages and uh, so on and so forth. So that's the two main things. And I think it is very important for, for us during the orientation. Okay. Yeah, maybe and, something else to add is like when you start, generally you don't start with the mindset of a researcher. You are more like engineer. You, you want to provide yeah. the tools or solutions, which is a little bit different from the mindset of a researcher. So yeah, I suggest to read a lot of papers, especially in the beginning, to get inside this, uh, this atmosphere of researchers and what kind of ideas you can work on. It's yeah. A, I think sometimes they refer that to POC, proof of concept, right? As a researcher, don't worry too much about engineering your code too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you all mentioned some problems you had, some mindset shifts, some, some other, I guess, general problems that you encountered at the start. Now, did you feel that it was productive for you to solve these problems? Or were there things that you wish you had done to speed up or avoid these problems? It, it, it was tough. It was tough. Especially, uh, let's say right now you're already in grad school, which means you probably did a good job in undergrad, right, in your classes. So now, so when I started, I just cannot, you know, Though everyone's telling me it's fine, you can spend a little bit less time on your classes, but it's still very hard for you to do so because you want to do good in the exam and projects. Uh, my suggestion is uh, maybe try to do things in a group because you will meet other new students who start together with you and take the same classes. So that can save you some time. Uh, at the same time, uh, my suggestion is try to talk a little bit more with your advisor. Because you know, at the very beginning, that's also important for you to get used to um, collaborating and working with your advisor. So make sure my, oh, this is actually important suggestion I'm going to get to everyone. So at the very beginning, actually for every semester, I think it's useful to have a meeting with your advisor and to make the expectations clear for the semester. Both your expectations from your advisor and your advisor's expectations from you. So at that time, if you think there's too much for you to do, just tell him or her, you know, that's, that's important. So in the end, you will, both of you won't be too, you know, frustrated about each other's time spent in this process yet. Right. Yeah, and I also suggest like, especially for my kids, it was the English stuff. So yeah, take courses, uh, especially the writing, the academic writing is difficult for uh, new students to try to take courses as soon as you can, like writing course, speaking course, etc. And for finding ideas, just try to discuss the most with your uh, your uh, teammates or with your supervisor. And here in Canada, we had um, we have a, a workshop, Caesar, uh, and there you can present like a poster or something like this, and you can get feedback from uh, other professors, from other people, right? Uh, so it's very good to go to such events and to present your work, like make a poster or make a presentation or something like this and can get feedback from people. Uh, uh, yeah, my first paper idea was coming from that workshop. So it's very good to, to try to get feedback from other people. It took a long time to, for me to find a very suitable research topic around uh, one year um, because, uh, you know, uh, when, when you look at the papers, you can easily have an idea that I can, uh, you can done 
uh, in very short time, short period, you can finish the paper, but the paper quality is not that high. But after that, you may think uh, during a long time of paper reading, you may find that uh, your um, previous research topic is not that interesting and you want to change to another totally new research topic. And at that time, you will be very confusing and uh, you will uh, have a tough time <laughs> because, um, you know, uh, during the new to the new uh, research uh, topic, um, you may not you may have the corresponding basic knowledge, and you need to, for example, for me, uh, during the first uh, year of my research uh, this, um, PhD period, uh, at, at that time, I, I first think about doing research on the um, app repository mining. It's about uh, combining the uh, AI or machining technology to mining text. But after that, I think uh, uh, maybe I'm more interested in the security things, but it's a totally new area. So for me, at that time, I were, I'm very confused because the security, uh, for the security area, we ha uh, have to uh, have the very solid and knowledge, um, you know, the basic skills for that uh, area. So um, during a long, uh, around, one year, I also changed to the previous, the, the original research idea. So uh, pursuing the research idea, maybe come along with the whole PhD period. Uh, maybe you do not need to set a uh, you know, uh, determined research topic during the start. We can uh, change a bit during the, during the period or uh, you know, maybe have new ideas or other research, interesting research topic to pursue during the period. Okay, great. And uh, you guys kind of touched on my next question, which was about how you get the most out of your advisor, right? Um, and, it, and you kind of mentioned that this was something that you learned along the way, right? Um, any tips for new students coming in um, on how to get the most out of their advisor? Well, uh, I have one suggestion is like dig deeper in your problems before asking your supervisor. <laughs> so <laughs> generally you'll have a better view on your data, on your projects than your supervisor. Your supervisor is a little bit an outsider for your projects. And when you come with new problems, it's, I mean, you don't get uh, the most of your supervisor when you come with problems and you expect him to fix your problems. Uh, but it's better to make I mean, to discuss with your supervisor, like, I have this problem, I tried this solution, it's not working, this one, this one, etc. So try to, to discuss with your problem, I mean, the solution that you tried, rather than I have this problem, how to fix it. That's it. Okay, <laughs> great. A any other tips? Or we've already said a lot about that. Um, so, okay, let's switch topics a little bit now. So um, there are a lot of different career paths that a PhD or a graduate degree can open up for you. Um, but at what point during your studies did you realize which career path you wanted to take? And what factors or events helped you make that decision? I, th I think that's a tough question because uh, I know students who always knows what they want to do, like since they were 10, <laughs> something like that. But I'm not that kind of, you know, student. I always try to figure out what I want to do. Like Shane just said, you know, with a graduate degree, let's say PhD degree, you can be a research faculty, you can be a teaching faculty, you can do research in industry, or you can just do development in industry. So there are a lot of options for you. I think the way I figure out that I want to do research after graduation, either research faculty or industrial research is, I, I think probably when I, when I went to my first conference and praised my work there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel, you know, how say that fulfilled when I try to tell others what I care about, then I realize others also care about what I'm doing. <laughs> so that's when I feel, oh, I think I belong to this, you know, this community. And also you need to think about during your 
you know, work, your grad school, which part make you the happiest, which part that you don't need to force yourself too much to devote time to it. For example, realize, oh, I really like teaching undergrads. Maybe think about teaching faculty path. Or maybe you realize, I really enjoy sitting in a computer tracking the, the most cutting edge research progress then to develop my own idea and do experiments, publish papers, then maybe you should do research. But maybe Maybe you're someone like I enjoy advising other junior students and also do research, then you may want to become a research faculty. So I think it's important to spend some time, you know, over the five or six years to think about what you enjoy the most. Yeah, then pick up a career because career is important. You may spend 30, 40 years on it. Yeah. Yeah, I strongly agree with you. Um, and my suggestion is that, uh, you know, uh, during the summer over the PhD, periods you can have choice to intern in some companies mm. maybe it, we can uh, yeah uh, find some chances to start uh, to intern in this company and to find whether development is interesting for you or whether you are more interested in uh, research because some group some companies also have uh, uh, some research labs yes uh, so students can choose to have a chance to experience in these um, big companies and to find uh, whether they are uh, indeed, like or, or dislike. So uh, that's my suggestion. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. So uh, maybe I would just add to try to experience something. So yeah, maybe your, uh, an internship in industry and also mm -hmm. try to do te some teaching uh, in your university, like maybe a TA in the beginning, maybe even uh, teaching the whole course. Uh, so I, for me, I had this opportunity. I gave some courses when I was a PhD student. And that's how I uh, decided to, to go for a, a faculty. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. right. I think there... Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think there are, yeah, some, a lot of universities, there are workshops, I think introducing them, you know, what the life is like to be a teaching factor, research factor, or some, anything else. So you can see if you like that kind of work style or not. Okay. And, and I guess a, a lot of the events and factors that helped you make your decisions were personal experiences, right? Like you got a taste of what a conference was like, and that's what got you excited about that kind of career. And you mentioned maybe trying some teaching experience will help you to see if that's for you. Were there any um, external explanations that could have helped or do you feel that getting these uh, concrete first person experiences is what you needed to help you make that decision? That's okay. Um, if that's a crazy question, then we can skip it. <laughs> <laughs> I think experience is important, so you should try try yourself first. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, for for me, my father was a professor, so <laughs> kind of biased. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure whether there are some uh, PhD students who care very much about the salary. You know, the sal salary for industry practitioners and the, for the professors are very different. So maybe salary is also one you know, factor for some students. Yeah, also job security. Like some, yeah. some people also care about that, yeah. yeah. Right, these are all things to consider. Um, so let's shift a little bit now into work-life balance. So um, how did you achieve work-life balance and did you struggle with that at all? Well, when you are a PhD student, generally you don't have time to think about this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, for me, it was not that difficult. I had a family, so it was um, a good thing to for for I mean, for depression and for all of those uh, balancing life and the work. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't think I'm the good person to give suggestions on this. <laughs> I think I think in grad school, I kind of feel what's go what's happening is if you want to do more, there's always more for you to do. <laughs> so you gotta know when to stop to give yourself a break. And just trust me, trust me. You know, while you after you you've been working hard for a while, 
it it actually makes you more productive if you take several days off. Yeah, that at least that's happened to me and the people around me. So sometimes, for example, maybe set up some rules for yourself, then stick to it. Something like you know, every time I have a paper accepted, I will give myself three or four days off. That's some rules I will stick to, or give yourself some rules like I will never work, you know, in Saturday afternoon or something like that. You know, you gotta try to. Try to help yourself. Try to force yourself to enjoy life a little bit. The other suggestion is in grad school. I think it helps in both health, like physical health and mental health, both to develop your own habit. Something that's not about work, just something that you really like, like painting, singing, or sports. Anything. Stick to that. Make friends. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. Mm, yeah.、Uh... I think it's very difficult to balance the the time before the deadline.、Um, you know, at that time, most of the、uh, of us will put our effort on the work. You,、uh, you will have no time to do sports or other kind of practice.、Uh, so at that time, it it's very tense. Tense, I think.、Uh, after that period, you be after deadline. I think that we can have some relax. And、uh, give us several days off, and、uh, to celebrate the the lot, <laughs> yeah, 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 give a break. And it, you will find out that、uh, if you have a holiday or after several days off, you will be more energetic on the research. So、uh, you have more energy to work harder,、uh, work hard, play harder, you know. So、uh, just balance the the time well, and、mm, don't put all time to to work. You will find out you will be very tired and have no. No interest in others. You will have no ideas on finding the good and interesting topics. I mean, yeah, that's my suggestion. Okay, great. And another thing that、uh, graduate students, young faculty deal with is this concept of imposter syndrome. Now,、um, I know that almost everybody. Has some something to say about imposter syndrome, so I'd love to hear what you three think. How did you cope with it?、Um, did you、uh, did you find some coping strategies are better than others?、Um, floor is yours. The 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 silence already tells everyone that this is a tough problem. Yeah, I think your PhD is not complete if you never experience imposter syndrome, and I've never seen anyone who never you know felt this. So just for people who don't know what it is, the imposter syndrome is a psychological phenomenon that every time when you achieve something, you feel you don't deserve it. You feel you're sort of like a fraud, you know. Like those success is not from your hard work or your a, a capability. That's not true. However, in grad school, because of pressure, peer pressure, or everything, everyone will feel that you didn't do good. You don't deserve them. So, if things get really bad, you know, as bad as it affects your work productivity, then you need to seek for professional help. So just don't feel bad to seek for those help. Every university has, you know, offices. Or organizations, they are there to help students.、Um, I think、uh, when, like in general, most of the times, it's it's just like a kind of negative feeling. I suggest you to talk to other people, you know, or talk to families or friends to get some encouragement. Or at the same time, you should tell yourself that you deserve it. Sometimes students may think, "Oh, my work is not as good as others," even though you probably have already published your papers on that. So in that time, if that's because you think other areas may be, you know, more technical heavy, so you think they are the real researchers, when that happens, you should tell yourself that it's not the case. It's not because you are not as good as others. It's just you choose to spend your time in a different thing. That's what everyone's doing. So you are the best in your own area. It's tough. So I would just say, when that happens to you. Don't feel alone. You are not alone. Like everyone is like that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I I think, as you said, everyone is on the same boat, right? 
So maybe just talk to other people and when everybody's facing the same problem, I guess this will help you to understand it's normal. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. So just talk to other people, other colleagues, maybe your supervisor as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think we can adjust our attitude towards such kind of thing. Uh, maybe it's a good thing for us. Uh, it gives us a lot of motivation to look on the better, the, the good one, the good example. We should, we can do uh, some uh, good, uh, more research or more publication or other kinds of achievements you want to have. So we can learn from them. They may have more, uh, you know, advantages that we can take, uh, take from them. Uh, so we can uh, uh, talk with them to see what, uh, why they can have so good achievement. So uh, maybe next time we can uh, use, use this kind of uh, takes uh, uh, in, our, uh, in ourselves. So I think we can look on a bad, 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 uh, good side, not the bad side for that kind of thing. Right, right. And everybody has different triggers for what uh, makes them feel like an imposter. But one of the things that, that really exacerbates it for different people is acceptance and rejection of their work, right? So um, why don't we talk a, a little bit about that? So believe it or not, we've all had papers rejected, I'm sure, right? So how did you deal with your first rejection? And then we'll flip that around and how did you celebrate your first acceptance? You can but, talk about either one first, if you like. Yeah, for, for me, I, my first rejection, I was disappointed, <laughs> like any human being. Uh, but yeah, when you talk to other people, you find it's normal like people get rejected once twice three times and even more and you hear some good stories like some people got rejected from um, a not well ranked conference and at the end they end up with a paper in the best conference uh, so you hear lots of those stories and you can get motivated and yeah and for phd or for research in general you start your research with very high motivation right and once you get the first rejection, it drops, right? So then you should work on it to, to be motivated again and just understand that this is normal to have a lot of papers rejected and to go up and down for motivation. So it's very normal as uh, in research. Yeah. yeah, rejection will come along all the, the, the period of a PhD. So, uh, uh, during my first uh, paper, I'm very lucky to get accepted. But the second paper, I remember very clearly, my supervisor told me to uh, uh, withdraw the <laughs> paper. <laughs> he said to me that the paper is not very ready for, uh, for the submission. So to, he, to, he even emailed the, the PC to see that whether the, the, the paper can be withdrawn. Wow. <laughs> you, you, know, you, know, you know, it's very, uh, a little bit disappointment, disappointed for me. But, uh, you know, at that time, I was only uh, the first year PhD student. So uh, I thought it, uh, it's just so slow. It's, uh, it's not, not that uh, serious. Uh, then in the second paper, I got uh, rejected. At that time, I was even very calm. But when the third and the, and the, and the fourth, the rejection comes, you will, you will not that even calm. You will, you will uh, doubt yourself whether you are really um, suitable for research, for research, whether you are um, really research material, you must think about that thing. So, um, so the period is very, uh, you know, at this point it is not uh, enough word for describe such kind of feeling. So um, um, maybe that time you can discuss with the seniors in the group to see whether uh, there are serious points in the paper that um, get rejection several times and try to fix these points before the next submission. Uh, don't be very harsh. You don't be very, uh, you know, uh, harsh, uh, rush for the next deadline. Uh, you, you, you have to fix these points before the next submission. In that way, the paper will have a higher chance to get uh, acceptance. So your confidence will be built up 
instead of rejected by several times, your confidence will be reduced uh, uh, or even uh, lost. <laughs> so uh, that's my suggestion. Yeah. Um after my first favorite rejection, I, I indeed, I, I feel mad. I mean, I just admit that. I was angry. I was like, because that's something I'm proud of. That's why I submit my favorite. Like, how can you just tell me this is not good? So, yeah, it's, so it's okay to feel mad, to feel angry, you know, for some time. But like, you know, what uh, Tony just said that uh, after you calm down, you know, you need to think about the, the reviews to to. So if you agree with that, to see like why they give you those reviews. Some of them, the, my experience, can be very constructive. So that's actually helpful for your improvement of your work. So, you know, just this is a normal in research to so just calm down, then talk to your advisor, your co-authors to see, to figure out what are the next steps you want to work on. So, yeah, don't worry. It will be accepted in the future after you improve that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, so we tend to focus a lot on papers, but are there any other triumphs or tragedies of your PhD that you want to discuss? So uh, the biggest hurdle that you overcame or the, the biggest challenge that you faced during your, your studies? Uh, I think, I think for, I'll speak a little bit more for international students, especially that you went to a country, you go to a country that speak a different language. So there will be cultural difference. Um, I would say try a little bit not to stay in your own, you know, group of friends. I mean, of course, it's important to have your own friends, you know, speak the same language. It's always easier to communicate. But it's also very important. That's why you go to a different country for a degree, right? You also want to experience, you know, different cultures and different people. Just be brave. Be brave to talk to people. And every time, my suggestion, especially for international students in, in your group, is every time in a discussion, if you didn't really catch something that they talked about, don't be worried about stopping them and asking them until you figure out what they mean. So that's a process, you know, you can learn. And I, I, I just, over the time, I realized that they won't be mad. They're actually very happy, happy to help you. They're glad that you want to kind of spend effort to involve, get involved into the discussion. Yeah. So that, that's actually, that, that, that's hard communication. Yeah, for me, I think like PhD is a long path. So you sh the, 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 the most important thing is to have fun, right? To enjoy what you are doing. Uh, otherwise, it will be a real pain. <laughs> yeah. To enjoy your, what you are doing, have fun. Uh, try to find the, in the beginning research projects that best fit you or that uh, you really want to work on. So don't do something that you are not really happy with. Yeah, so... Just try to make your experience or your four or six years PhD uh, an enjoyable period, an enjoyable experience. Yeah, and as suggested before, like maybe do some activities. Sport is good. Uh, do some parties when you have time. Uh, talk to other people. So there are lots of things that you can do when, to make your um, PhD an enjoyable experience. Uh, for me, uh, the biggest crisis happened uh, in the third year of my PhD period uh, because for us, we have to graduate in the fourth year. And uh, if, if we don't uh, meet, the, meet, meet the requirements for the graduation, we have to extend the, you know, the PhD period. Uh, so at the time, I was very uh, upset and worried uh, because uh, uh, our supervisor have the requirement, basic paper requirements for us. And I didn't meet the, the basic requirement at the time. So um, although I have one research idea and I have done two papers and the papers haven't got published or got uh, accepted. So uh, I'm very confused whether I need to change my research topic or do I need to pursue, uh, you, know, you know, just the, just be strong and, and be, you know, insisted on that. Uh, so 
uh, at the time, I think it's the very big, biggest uh, crisis. Um, and the, the thing that I got through is that I changed my research topic a bit. Uh, so uh, the, the, new, the new paper got published. Uh, that's, um, I, but the period is very harsh. And um, for me, I didn't want to go through a second time. <laughs> but the biggest triumph, I think, uh, uh, there are a lot of things, not the biggest one. Uh, you can enjoy a lot of things during your PhD period. Uh, enjoy the relationship with your teammates or have some achievements in your public for your publication or even uh, meet some uh, you know the seniors you know there are always some models in your research area you can meet these models during the conference and have pictures with them all the all of these things will make you very happy uh, you can imagine that you know uh, so I think a PhD is a very exciting experience uh, in, there are bad things, good things, uh, all those things make up our life. So just to uh, go, through, go through that and experience th th these things, I think, yeah. Great. Yeah, okay. So I, I got through my list of topics. Um, was there anything we missed? Any other comments you'd like to make for the next generation of uh, software engineering researchers? I don't feel we talked most of the time, you know, on challenges that we have in grad school, but I really want to point out that grad school is great. <laughs> Software engineering is great. Yeah, so we are here today. Just try to, you know, give you suggestions so it can be an easier, more efficient process and time for you. But in general, I, I, I'm really glad that, you know, I picked this path and try to pursue a PhD degree. And uh, my personal career goal is to become um, either an industrial researcher or research faculty. So I, because I'm very senior, I, I'm about to graduate, but of course, like Muhammad and Tsui, they already graduated. So after, when I look back, I learned a lot from the process. It's totally worth it. It's a tough, but it's worth it. Yeah, you should totally do a PhD in software engineering. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Anybody want to counter that? Should they run away? <laughs> Okay, well, great. Well, thanks everyone for taking the time and uh, hope this is useful for the viewers out there.